hey guys what's up welcome back to the channel my name is kennedy if you're new here if you're not new hey girl how have you been child today's case is so annoying like some police officers will never beat the coffee donuts allegations like is that all y'all do is that all y'all do but i won't drag the intro let's go ahead and hop into today's case So before we hop into today's case, we have a word from our sponsor, Thrive Market. If you're unfamiliar, Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store whose mission is to make healthy living easy and affordable for everyone. And Thrive Market is offering you guys, the True Crime Baddies, 30% off your first order. When you join today at the link in my description, thrivemarket.com slash truecrimekin. But let's get into what we got. I was so happy when they reached out because I was actually already looking into Thrive. Um, Y'all know Bradley, my toddler, he has a speech delay. And the one thing he's very much into using his words and asking for is snacks. So I was looking into Thrive because I'm trying to fill the pantry with healthier staples and snacks that are better for him because when he does use his words to ask for things, I don't like to tell him no, but he can't be eating junk food all day and night. So that's what I focused on with my Thrive order. High quality, healthy snacks for him that he would enjoy, still kind of kid friendly. And on Thrive Market, not only is it cheaper than going into your specialty grocery stores, I don't live close to a specialty grocery store. Y'all know I live in the middle of the woods. And if I did drive 30 minutes out to a nicer grocery store, I would be paying a premium in store. And on top of Thrive Market being affordable and having everything you need all in one place, orders over $49 ship for free and they price match. What's also fantastic about Thrive is that you can filter their entire selection by your different dietary needs, whether you're gluten-free, vegan, keto. You can shop by concern. So there's like an adrenal thyroid section for snacks that'll help you out in that area. How cool is that? When you go to the website, you can really see that Thrive Market has put a lot of effort and intention behind serving everybody, okay? But of the things that we got, these Partake Vanilla Sprinkle Cookies, I have to re-up on those immediately. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Yummy, yummy, yummy. But of course, I also had to get some things for myself. Y'all know it wouldn't be me if I didn't get a cake mix and sprinkles. I was really excited to see that they had that. I wasn't even in the cake, you know, baking mindset when I was looking on to Thrive. So, can't wait to try those. The Califia Farms Caramel Macchiato Creamer is going triple platinum in my kitchen as we speak. So click the link in my description, head over to thrivemarket.com slash truecrimekin to get 30% off your first order and a free gift up to $60 when you join Thrive Market today. Shout out to them one more time for sponsoring today's video. Okay, hey guys, somebody sat down on their lawnmower to cut their grass as soon as I sat down. I don't know if y'all can hear that, but again, we gotta keep this show on the road. It's summertime, child, their lawnmowers is gonna be lawnmowering. But we're gonna go ahead and open the package I showed y'all last time from Too Faced. But while we open this stuff, I'm gonna go ahead and tell y'all about um, <laughs> them playing my 911 call on the uh, news. I've told this story maybe a couple of times before on the channel, but I know some people are new, but basically a plane crashed into my neighbor's house. <laughs> But I didn't know that, like I couldn't see anything, like I heard it and then I looked out of my front door and all I could see was smoke, like I couldn't see anything. You know, I just heard a super loud, like I mean probably the loudest noise I've ever heard in my entire life, a plane crashed, you know. So it freaked me out, I called 911 in a panic because I was only like 17 at the time I believe. And I was at home with my son, so I was freaking the fuck out. And they played my 911 call of me calling 911 to see like what exactly was going on on the news. So basically, the plane it was like a smaller, like single person plane. It was just the the um, pilot on the plane, and I think if I remember correctly, he had like a heart attack or something like that in the air, and that's why the plane crashed. If I remember correctly, I don't know, child. It was a while ago, but. The plane hit a tree on its way down and kind of like spun out and hit two houses. Basically, one house was totally like 
demolished like no more house left the other house it kind of like clipped into the roof um but anyways like the picture on the screen okay let me look at the picture okay so you can see the two houses that are affected and then the house over and then the road the road wraps around to the right and then on the other side of the street was my house so like i couldn't see anything it was a bunch of smoke i was freaking out i called 911 the bitch told me a plane crashed and i was like what like i didn't know if i needed to evacuate like what is the procedure when a plane crashes across the street from your house i didn't know i was confused and terrified to say the least and they weren't letting anybody in or out of my neighborhood but like i've told y'all before my stepdad is a police officer so he was able to come back and get us out of there but yeah girl plane crashed across the street from my house Oh, 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 and the pilot of the plane was the only person who passed away. Everybody else was fine. I think the house that was totally demolished in the accident was empty and nobody was hurt. But yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> but anyway, in the Too Faced package, we got the Too Faced Lip Injection Maximum Plump. And then y'all know I love these lip injection lip glosses. So this is basically like the lip injections gloss, but it's got some color to it. We are probably gonna wear this today. What color is this in? And then we got mascara and the lash primer. Then the Hangover RX primer. Y'all know about this. We can use this today too. We got a eyeliner. Ooh, she's sharp. And then this natural nudes palette. Very pretty, very pretty. And then a big mirror. Like this is the perfect travel pal palette. I love a big mirror. But for today's case, guys, we're in Laureldale, Pennsylvania. January 13th, 2012. Today's case is so rotten. But in the middle of the night around 2.30, okay, Jackie Hollenbach and her husband terry had only been in bed and asleep for a few hours after coming back home from a work holiday party and jackie hollenbach was awakened by her dog who was trying to like alert her of something going on she said she woke up to like a weird smell and got up to investigate because she could tell that something was off by the way her dog was acting okay now miss jackie hollenbach is on the third level of her home it's the top floor the main floor and then like a basement apartment and she is immediately alarmed because when she is making her way down the stairs to the main floor of the house she realizes that her front door is open like cracked open so when she makes her way down the stairs and realizes that the front door is open, she wakes up her family friend, Corey, who was good friends with her husband, who stayed at the house from time to time, you know what I'm saying, when he needed like the extra help. So he was asleep in the living room on their pullout couch. So she woke him up. So she wakes up family friend, Corey, but her immediate concern is her niece, Audrey who was 17 years old at the time and lived in the home in the basement apartment with her boyfriend and their two kids. So from the basement door, like, you know, down before you get into the steps, she called out to Audrey. She didn't get a response and she tried to flip the lights on, but the lights to the basement weren't working. So instead of going down there on her own, Corey says, you know, I'm gonna go back upstairs and get Terry, you stay right there. So Corey and Terry come back downstairs and then make their way into the basement. They make their way down into the basement. They're calling out to Audrey. She's not answering. And then they realize that the lights aren't turning on because the light bulbs have been busted out. There is glass all over the floor from somebody busting out these light bulbs. So down in the basement, they make their way to Audrey's bedroom. They open her bedroom door in this basement apartment and she's in bed, but her body's com completely covered by her bed sheet. Her uncle Terry pulls the sheet back and finds Audrey in a pool of blood. He checks her pulse and Audrey has passed away. 
So obviously they scoop up her children from the basement apartment, go back upstairs and call 911. So just to backtrack, there are one, two, three, four, five, six people living in the home at the time. Terry Hollenbach and his wife, Jackie, who are asleep on the top level, okay? Corey, the family friend who was on the pullout couch, and then Audrey and her two daughters, who I won't include in today's video because they are grown women child just trying to live their lives and navigate their situation. But also her daughter's father, Anthony, who is nowhere to be found at the time of the events of today's case, okay? And obviously the house is swarmed with police and detectives right away. Laureldale, small, quaint, chill town who hadn't had a murder in almost eight decades. They hadn't had a murder since 1932 until January 13th, 2007. Audrey had been shot once in the head, super close range. You know, there was nothing to be done. She died almost instantly. And in inspecting the scene, they're pretty sure that um, Audrey didn't see this coming until right at the last minute. Like even though it was two o'clock in the morning, she was not asleep because she had a defensive wound. The bullet went through her hand before going into her head. So she was, you know, trying to shield herself before she passed away, before she was murdered. And right off the bat, detectives thinks, you know, this is somebody in the household. Ain't no way somebody then came down into the basement through the front door shot this girl and left without nobody seeing anything what exactly is going on there was no signs of forced entry nothing had been taken or moved around there was no signs of a struggle and nobody woke up so obviously they want to talk to everybody in the house the only person they can't put their finger on who's not at the scene is her boyfriend like i said anthony but getting word from the people who were there you know Jackie, Terry, and Corey, they say that it was a pretty normal night and both couples were actually headed out to a party. Audrey and Anthony were going to Anthony's mother's house for a birthday party. And then like I said, Jackie and Terry were headed out to a work party. Jackie and Terry said nothing seemed, you know, out of the ordinary. There was no arguments or anything like that. It was a chill, normal day. They obviously want to talk to Anthony Chow, but he is missing in action and no one can get him on the phone. So they're talking to the people they have tangibly at the scene and they start searching the home and they find shell casings in the toilet. Like obviously somebody tried to flush them, but heavy ass stuff like that does not flush, obviously, you know? And of course, the shell casings found in the toilet match whatever was used to shoot Audrey. It was presumed to be a nine millimeter gun. They figure if the shell casings are in the toilet, then the gun should be close by, but they're looking and they don't find a weapon in the home or dumped in the surrounding area. So eventually, Anthony pulls up in a vehicle with some of his friends and they kind of just like drop him off at the curb and he walks towards the scene. Once Anthony is on the scene, they give him the lowdown of everything that's happened and they say he has little to no reaction, which is concerning, okay? So they decide to move, you know, everybody from the front yard to the police station so they can ask everybody questions and vet them thoroughly in a more proper setting. So talking to Audrey's aunt and uncle, they found out that Audrey had been living in their like basement apartment since she had been pregnant with her youngest daughter and Audrey and Jackie were super close. And though Audrey was a teen mom, she was doing absolutely fantastic. Jackie had gotten Audrey a really good job at the same place she worked and she was taking care of her business, saving up to get her own place, had also purchased a car. 
and was really doing what she needed to do to blossom into the best young woman and mother she could be and Jackie and Terry said that their home life was great like they loved having the kids and their great nieces in the house they all got along and they all pulled their weight even Anthony they all helped out around the house cooking dinners cleaning up you know they just weren't occupying this space and being disrespectful being kids they were in here doing the right thing and Jackie and Terry knew that you know soon that they would be on their feet and ready to move out and they weren't excited they didn't want the kids to leave and they said you know the couple Audrey and Anthony they did fight a little here and there but I mean they were young kids navigating being parents figuring their life out nothing too out of the ordinary but there was a fight recently that was kind of out of hand they were arguing in the front yard because because Anthony was trying to go out for the night and Audrey didn't want him to she didn't want to be left at home with the kids she felt like he was going out too much and she like followed him out to the front yard where he was being pricked picked up basically yelling at each other in the front yard you better not leave you better not leave me here with the kids again like that type of vibe and when they talk to Anthony they feel like he is combative not really willing to help he actually tells police like if you think I'm guilty then go ahead and arrest me like I don't know what to tell you they ask him if he owns a similar gun the nine millimeter but he says no but then when they look into his record he did have some gun charges so they know that he didn't own a gun on paper but he was no stranger to them okay but all they have is speculation when it comes to Anthony no hard hitting evidence and then lastly they talk to Corey the family friend who lives in the home and Corey tells them you know right off the bat he does own a gun it's a nine millimeter but he says he didn't keep it in the home with the kids you know he didn't think it would save he said it was an hour and some change away at his mother's house that's where he kept his weapon but they still do drive out to make sure that weapon is where it's supposed to be and they confirmed that the weapon was an hour and some change away at Corey's mother's house. And at this point the detectives aren't really trusting nobody because their main issue um, with the case is that how did nobody hear anything? They're very, 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 very confused as to how this girl was shot in the basement and nobody woke up. So they go to the home to like scope the scenery out and what they decide to do is put one detective in the basement bedroom where Audrey was asleep in there banging paint cans together you know trying to simulate the same kind of noise as a gunshot all right and he was doing that in the basement they had somebody on the main level and then somebody on the third floor to see if they could hear you know the commotion and surprisingly you couldn't and they think it's because of the way the basement was built the basement's walls were cemented in you know with like cinder blocks so the basement was pretty much soundproof so this leads them to cut the family just a little bit of slack because it is plausible that nobody was awoken awakened by the sound of the gunshots but unfortunately for detectives they just have no concrete evidence linking really anybody to the case, even though they feel like Anthony is their strongest suspect. There's no physical evidence and you can't really rely on DNA or anything like that being found in the home because he lived there as well. They couldn't really narrow in on anybody who lived in the home. They didn't have any other suspects or any you know similar crimes that had happened in the area but everybody including the family narrowed in on anthony you know just waiting for there to be enough evidence to charge him they talked to bobby and the friends he was with on the, on the night of the murder and they don't have a solid alibi all of them kind of have a different story and they said they were kind of just riding around all night which cannot be verified. 
And over the next couple of years, they kind of just let the case stall, you know, waiting for that evidence that they needed to link Anthony to the case. But it just never came. Years passed. Audrey's daughter stayed with her aunt Jackie and had no contact with their father. And everybody kind of moves on with their lives. Jackie and Terry decide they can't stay in that home where Audrey died. They can't, you know, raise her daughters there. So they move. Anthony moves away. And nobody knows exactly what happened to Audrey for a full three years. And so what actually does kind of break this case. Oh, there's something in my eye. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And what actually breaks this case open in January 2011 is actually one of the most frustrating things I think I've come across in a long time. So a new detective picks up the case and to me, to me, y'all tell me how you feel, but to me, he asked the obvious question. So he's looking back through the case files and he sees, you know, that they ruled out Corey as a suspect because his gun was nowhere near the crime scene. And so he's looking through the paperwork, he's looking through the paperwork and what he realizes is that it doesn't say anywhere in the reports that the officers who went to his home, his mother's home, to check on the weapon visually saw it, like have eyes on the gun an hour and some change away from their crime scene. And he's like, I know good and goddamn well this case ain't set for three years because one of our suspects was ruled out because somebody said the gun was an hour and a half away, but nobody saw it. Like he's like, there's no way that these officers went all that way, but didn't actually physically put their eyes on a weapon. There's no way. And he's like, you know, well, even if it was, we need to test it anyway. It should have been tested anyway. It was a gun matching the shell case was found on the scene. Like why the hell was the gun not tested? So he does some digging, does some calling and realizes that mm -mm, they didn't see the gun. They didn't see it that night. They went to the home, knocked on the door, asked Corey's mother if the gun was there. She said left and then they left. You'll never be able to make that make sense to me. So now three years later, this new detective is like, well, shit, the first step in busting this case wide open is probably going to be locating that weapon three years later and testing it. So all these years later, they catch up to Corey, ask him if he still owns the nine millimeter, nine millimeter weapon. He says yes, and he willingly hands it over and they send it off to be tested against the bullet found in her skull. Do I even have to tell you what? Do I even have to tell you? Do we even have to go there? Do we even have to tell you what happened? I'm sure we're all smart. You know, we can figure it out. The weapon matches. Corey's gun was the weapon that killed Audrey. So all this comes together for detectives March 15th, 2011, and they get the arrest warrant to go scoop up Corey. And Corey is arrested for the murder of 17 year old mother of two, Audrey Giannotti. And child, the detective's next job is to figure out why. What was the reason? And luckily for detectives at this point, Corey is willing to give a full confession and they learned that Corey had basically been plotting on Audrey. He said he saw Anthony leave the home that night and he realized that Anthony was kind of sneaking out. And he said after Anthony left, he went down to the basement with his firearm tucked under his arm, no pants on, just a shirt and tried to have sex with Audrey. But Audrey wasn't with the shit. She did not want to touch his old, fat, smelly, stinking ass. And so instead of just taking his L in peace, he shot her. And then he said he smashed out the light bulbs so nobody would be able to see anything. 
He said the gun was on the scene the entire time. Detectives just didn't find it. He said he didn't have a car at the time, okay? But he had put the gun in Terry and Jackie's car and they just never looked when they were searching the home and that after, you know, the chaos was over, he retrieved his weapon and that was it. I mean, and obviously the family is just absolutely shocked. This whole time, A, they thought it was Anthony. And throughout the years, Corey had remained a close family friend. He was around Audrey's daughter, spending time with the whole family and they never knew. Audrey's aunt, Jackie, was quoted in an interview through tears saying, you know, the whole time um, they were waiting for someone to be charged with the murder. You know, she was triple checking her doors, making sure everything was locked up tight to keep the perpetrator out. And she says the whole time what she didn't realize is that she was actually locking the perpetrator in because Corey spent so much time with the family. This man heard us crying all the time. I kept thinking all these years I was locking the person out of my house. Meanwhile, the whole time I was locking him in. And obviously, Audrey's uncle Terry is the one who's presumably the most upset because Corey was his friend you know he was the reason that Corey was around and this is where I would have stopped being a police officer this is why I, don't ever give me no badge if this man would have found this out in the same vicinity as Corey baby all I can do is put my hands up and turn right turn away beat his ass knock him out drag his dick through the dirt okay because he deserves to have his ass beat he was totally hiding in plain sight. So, old freaky nasty Corey Van Guren, that's his full name, sentenced to life in prison, not getting out, not stopping, not passing go. And to think that this man got away with this murder for years because they narrowed in so deeply on their first suspect. And they had tunnel vision towards Anthony. Now, Anthony is not his real name, did not include his real name in... <clears throat> this video because i mean he's gone through enough not only did this not only was he accused of this murder dragged through the mud in the media but it cost him his relationship with his daughters you know i also did not include um audrey's daughters their information in this video just out of respect i mean let people move on with their lives but i could not not tell this story it's just absolutely fucking nuts I mean, I truly don't understand how they felt like they did a thorough investigation and let this case sit for three years without laying eyes on that gun. Like narrowing in so deeply on one suspect with total disregard that the other suspect has a gun that matches just because he said it wasn't in the home. It's crazy. The biggest ball was dropped costing the family even more trauma even more heartache this man doesn't see his kids i hope anthony sued he he's owed some money they owe him a little settlement and her children because uh, negligence 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 and speaking of negligence this true crime tiktok is absolutely nuts so this woman, her name's Luz, and one day she's at home and her husband is outside fixing a car for his cousin. But then suddenly, kaboom, their house catches on fire and Luz is inside and she's terrified because she has three kids in the house. So she sends her older two kids outside to safety and then she runs straight upstairs to where her newborn baby daughter is sleeping in her crib. And we'll call the newborn, newborn. Anyway, Luz runs upstairs and there's smoke everywhere and she's starting to get burned, but she powers through it. She refuses to leave Newborn. But when Luz gets to Newborn's room, Newborn's crib is empty and Luz panics. I mean, this can't be possible. Newborn was just in there sleeping. But unfortunately, Luz can't stay any longer. Like the fire is burning her face and the smoke is just becoming too overwhelming. So she has to leave the building for her own safety. And then finally, the fire department gets there and they start putting out the fire. And eventually they're able to check the building and they have some terrible news. Newborn didn't make it. Everything in that area of the house was completely burned up beyond recognition. And Luz is just heartbroken. I mean, she can't believe it. Like, Newborn is gone. And sadly, she has no other option but to just grieve and go on with her life.
Until six years go by and Luz is at a birthday party for one of her friend's kids. And it's like one of those parties where there's a bunch of little kids there. And Luz sees this little girl. That little girl has a dimple. And Luz is like, wait a minute, that's exactly like my dimple. And Luz can't help but notice this little girl looks a lot like her and like her other kids. And she is positive that little girl is somehow newborn. I mean, newborn wasn't in her crib six years ago when that fire started. Plus, firefighters never found the body. The area was burned up beyond recognition. So somehow newborn must have got out. I mean, this has to be her. Now, Luz knows she can't just run over and snatch this little girl up in front of everyone. I mean, someone brought her there. That might look kind of weird. So Luz Luz needs to be slick. She needs definitive proof that this is newborn. So she calls the little girl over and she tells her, hey, you've got gum stuck in your hair. And then Luz pretends to get the gum out. While she's there, she low-key yanks out five strands of hair from this little girl's head and she puts it into a plastic bag. Luz wants to use these hairs to test the little girl's DNA. But the problem is, police closed her case years ago, so they're not going to agree to this. So she reaches out to a state representative, this guy, Representative Cruz. So Luz gets a meeting with Cruz, and she goes to his office, and for an hour and a half, she pleads for him to help her. And eventually, he gives in, and he passes the hair on to the district attorney. District attorney opens an investigation, gets the hair tested, and sure enough, Luz is right. That six-year-old girl at the party is actually newborn. So, how did newborn go from being in a crib during a house fire to being at a kid's birthday party six years later? Okay, so here's what really happened. So this woman, her name's Carolyn. So Carolyn is allegedly pregnant, or at least that's what she tells everyone. Apparently she's not. She just likes to tell people she is. The problem with that is pretty soon people are going to know she's lying when nine months go by and she doesn't produce a baby. But then one day the brakes on Carolyn's car go out. And so she takes the car to her cousin's house to get it fixed. Now her cousin is a very distant cousin. By marriage, she doesn't even really know him all that well. But he is a mechanic. His name's Pedro. So Carolyn goes to Pedro's house to get her brakes fixed, and while she's waiting, she waits in Pedro's house where his wife is. His wife is this woman, Luz. So while she's there, Carolyn notices Luz has a newborn baby sleeping in a crib. And Carolyn desperately wants that baby. So when Carolyn's car is done being worked on, she pretends to leave. But she also secretly sets Pedro and Luz's house on fire. And while Pedro and Luz are scrambling, Carolyn sneaks into Newborn's room and she steals her out of the crib. Then she takes Newborn home with her across state lines and she tells everyone, Hey, look, I had my baby. And she raises Newborn as her own. Six years later, she takes Newborn to a family member's birthday party. And Luz just happens to be there and she just happens to recognize her own daughter. Anyway, police eventually arrest Carolyn, here's her mugshot, and she's charged with kidnapping and a bunch of other stuff, and she's found guilty, and she's sentenced to a minimum of nine years in prison, a maximum of 30 years in prison. And after all was said and done, Newborn was ultimately reunited with Luz and was raised by her. The good ending. Shout out to Philadelphia, New Jersey. I'm trying to find a documentary or something on this case because I need the ins and outs. I have to know exactly what happens. Because that is crazy. Set somebody's house on fire to take their baby? What? Like, what if she would have killed the other kid? I, girl. Before you leave, don't forget to check out Thrive Market through the link in my description, thrivemarket.com slash truecrimekin. Join today to get 30% off your first order plus a free gift worth up to $60. But that is a wrap on today's true crime and makeup video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe before you leave. Of course, as always, leave your thoughts, comments, and opinions in the comments down below. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.